Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Look, I mean, to begin with, it's it's an absolute honor to be here to talk at the Creative Mornings. I had no idea this event even happened in Dubai. I think some of you probably have with me. And I've looked up the speakers all around the world. It's, it's an amazing lineup of speakers who speak at Creative Mornings. So really, really pleased I'm here and really, really surprised that so many people would wake up that early to be here in Dubai, which is not really that easy. The topic is creativity, and I have to be honest that talking about creativity in the span of 20, 30 minutes is like trying to bottle the ocean for you. It's going to be a bit hard, but I'm going to try and do my best. The last time I gave a talk in Dubai on the same topic, I had five minutes. That was the format to deliver all, but it's a little bit different today because I have a little bit more time. So I'll try and do more justice to it. Uh, inclusion is the theme. So creativity and inclusion sort of go really well together. And we'll talk about that. <clears throat> I've put this up as my topic because creativity is the answer. What is the question is a, is a topic that I kind of stole from another talk that I heard where the topic was technology is the answer. What's the question? But I think creativity is more appropriate than technology. So in creativity, sometimes you have to steal and do it really well. Yeah. So I took this topic off that. Why do I want to talk about creativity? It's, it's a fact in today's world when we look at the news and we look at everything that's going on, going on around in the world, we're getting more and more divided as we go. Right? I mean, we are definitely closer from a geographical point of view and from all the devices that we have, but you only have to look at the news to go how divided we are. Right? Creativity for me is the one thing that has no race, gender, class, creed, whatever you want. Creativity is only concerned with creating. And that's why I'm very fascinated by creativity. My journey along this course started way back when I was really, really small, very small when I had a near-death experience. I was really small when my mother found out that she was going to have a boy back in India. And my parents felt that they don't want another boy because they already had three of them. And if you have three boys, you kind of understand why they don't want to have a fourth. That was me. Yeah. So in India, they had this, uh, you know, a lot of it is about old wives tales and what do you do when you don't want to have a child. So my mother was told, you need to eat papaya. Right? Raw papaya will do the trick. And she ate a lot of papaya. Clearly it didn't work because I'm still here. Yeah. And I've, for the longest time, tried to figure out why I've loved papaya every time I've seen it. <laughs> I'm just really happy that they didn't decide on broccoli. So that would have been a little too long. Papaya was okay. So that was an unplanned beginning for me. That's the way I see my life. And all of, the, of my life since then has been a series of unplanned accidents that have led me to where I am today. So if I fast forward a bit from that, to my education. I was a pretty average student in school, I'll admit it. My mind was mostly outside school. I was in theater and I was in public speaking and all of that, but not really studying. I was okay, I wasn't a failure, but I didn't really study that hard. When I graduated from school, when I left school, I took up mathematics because for some strange reason, I had a head for figures and people felt I would be good in math. So that's what I did in college. But I did it in college without actually doing anything about it. I went to the classes, I took the exams, but I wasn't really there. I was outside in my college, we had these things in the gutters. Again, I was out there talking to people about all things in the world, but mathematics. Yeah. When I finished my college, it left me with a massive question about what do I do next? One thing I was very clear about is I didn't want to study anymore because it just, just wasn't working for me. But then in those days, left me with very few options. I had a friend who used to work in advertising in India. And one fine day, I walked into the ad agency just to meet him. It wasn't anything that I had planned. I just went to meet him. And I walk into this room, which was the creative department of the ad agency, full of smoke, with a lot of people smoking. And I see my friend in the corner with his feet up on the table and a pad in his hand, gazing intently at a piece of paper and trying to do something. So I asked him, look, what are you doing? Right? And he said, I'm trying to come up with an idea to sell soap. And I go like, that's, that's cool, you get paid for that? And he said, yeah, you get paid for that. 
And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to think of ideas. So I pestered the creative director of the agency over three weeks and he gave me a test to do it. So let's see if you can actually be creative. And I went and I read all the books on creativity and I took that creative test. It was called a copy test in those days. I don't know what it's called now. And I went back and I submitted it and I waited for two, three days. Nothing happened. Then he calls me up and says, I, I want to see you. So I said, Mate, this is either good news or bad news. So I showed up and he said, uh, did you read books on advertising and do this? I said, yeah. He said, it's crap. It's completely <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. And he said, what I want you to do is I want you to do the same thing, but how Ali would do it. Not how somebody else did it. Not how somebody else wrote about it, but I want to know how you would do it. I said, okay. So I went back this time, took another few days. Didn't look at a single book. I just poured my heart out on that text, whatever it is that I wanted to do. And I submitted it. And two days later, he called me and said, this feels right. You've got a job. So my advertising career started that way in India. And then from there on, I moved on to other things to a pretty fairly successful career. What I've done in the last 25 years is advertising, but essentially worked with some of the biggest brands in the world, from India to Singapore and now in Dubai, with some of the best creative minds in the world, trying to solve problems that are not just to do with selling soap, but actually to do with selling life problems and world problems. I've trained creative people and I continue to be a student of creativity. And it's always fascinating to me that all through my life, I've heard this sentence, which James actually just said, Everybody is creative. Just five minutes ago, that's what he said. Everybody is creative. I agree with Gilbert, Elizabeth Gilbert, the author of uh, Eat, Love, and Create. Everybody is creative. But I beg to differ slightly because if everybody is creative, then we should be having a very creative world. Right? Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. But do we? Not really. So my theory, after observing so many people and working with so many creative people, is yes, everybody is creative, but they seem to have lost that mojo of creativity. They have lost that skill somewhere along the way, or even failed to actually even develop that skill. Why do I say that with such confidence? Because I can tell you that each one of us was creative at one point. Super creative at one and everyone can be creative. Think back at your childhood. Think back at a child you would observe. That is the most creative individual you have ever seen. Children, as children, we took things apart. We broke things. We created things. We drew on walls. We drove our parents crazy by asking why, 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 why. Anybody a parent here gets that and why not, right? And we didn't really care. But there was an essential quality about a child and why a child does that. A child does that without fearing any kind of judgment. A child doesn't think about, is anyone going to think I'm crazy? Is anyone going to think I'm stupid or foolish to have done that? You know, a child just does it because a child inherently is creative. And then something magical happens. It's not very good, but happens. We go to school. Yeah. And I'm by no means knocking academics. I love colleges, I love schools, I have deepest respect for my teachers. But the school system is designed to suck out creativity from us, at least it used to be. So there's an example of a kid who actually wrote an answer to what is the strongest force on earth. It was not an igneous rock or a sedimentary rock or a pet rock for her, it was love. But sorry, that's the wrong answer. So we are taught in school that there is a right answer and a wrong answer, but we're never told there's a creative answer or even celebrated if we come up with a creative answer. So that's school for us. And if you don't believe me, this is the first test for you today. Right? What do you get when I smell is a question that was posed to fourth graders in Japan. <coughs> I don't want you to shout out the answer. But I definitely want you to write down somewhere what you think is the answer. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. You don't need to share it with me. I'll just write it down. What do you get when I smell this?
Done? Good. So why is creativity such a big deal today? Well, let's just go back a little bit quickly and look at us as human beings on this planet we call Earth. Creativity for the longest time when you think about it has been the single reason why we've solved all our problems in the past. That's a Neanderthal man with a spear in his hand. But what that really signifies is when we were on this planet, we had no idea how to catch our food. I'm sure our old ancestor tried to run along with the deer or whatever it was to catch it, but that was faster than him or her. So they made the spear so they could chuck it and catch that fast moving animal before it got away. That's creativity. Solving a problem was how they got around issues. How did we manage to fly? The Wright brothers invented the plane, but very few people know that they had almost a hundred attempts before they actually got a plane up in the air. What did that solve? Distance. If you think about any of the problems that the world has faced, it's always been creativity at the heart of being able to come across with a solution. And now today, as we all probably live in this world, we are thinking about what's going on in the world today. We seem to have moved. We almost feel like we're on the cusp of something big that's coming. The modern day issues are kind of different. They're not about catching a deer that's running faster than you. We've gone past that, right? Today we have other issues. We have environmental problems that the scientists say in 12 years could put us on the road of extinction. That's just a fact. I mean, it's out there for you to read, right? That's one. The other thing that bothers us as workers, as corporate citizens, as people who run companies, is our machines going to take our jobs? Heard that before, right? Read that before? Our machines going to replace us? It's a real problem. And it's not just a problem, it's a reality that's coming up soon. So that is not just McDonald's uh, a clever poster, but that's the reality of what's going to happen. Again, the problems in the future will require creativity to be able for us to navigate them. And if that doesn't convince you, I'm just going to share a fact with you that I found amazing. IBM very recently ran a survey with 1,500 CEOs around the world. And the question that was asked to them was, please tell us what's the number one skill for an individual in the future? And the chart speaks for itself. They all rated creativity. 60% of them said creativity is the number one skill somebody would need in the future. Even higher than integrity, even higher than dedication, humility, fair, all of those qualities we feel is good for leaders. That was the number one skill of the future. I'm going to now spend a little bit of time busting a few myths about creativity that we've all grown up with. And we all kind of popularly believe. I'll start with the first one. That creativity somehow, we've been told, is this bolt of lightning and inspiration that will hit you at some point. Right? Like it did with Archimedes, if you know the story. And you probably you may not run around the streets naked shouting Eureka, but close to <coughs> Yeah? You'll just be fascinated. You have to put this down and you've solved. You've got the cure for cancer. No. It doesn't work that way because creativity is a laborious, hard process of sticking with a problem and trying to repeatedly come up with a solution till you do. Archimedes spent years before he actually got the solution reportedly in the bathtub. Right? So it's not the Eureka moment. This is another myth of creativity that's so popular in our times. Have you ever been told you're left brain or right brain? Anybody? Yeah. Or left brain being right brain, being left brain. Yeah. One is creative, one is logical. Well. The good news or the bad news, depending on how you take it, is neuroscientists have concluded conclusively that that's not true. There is no right brain or left brain, we are brained. When we have a problem to tackle or when we're trying to do something, both parts of the brain come together to solve the problem. I'm sorry, but that's a myth, right? You can still teach this in schools if you want to, but it's just no longer true. So, I'm going to move quickly then from there to the two principles that, for me, form the cornerstone of creativity. I love this quote, it's not mine. Creativity is dancing on the precipice of failure. This is a quote from a person who works at a company called Pixar. Has everybody heard of Pixar? Yeah. yeah. 
they are probably one of the most creative companies in the entire world. And this is from him. I love this quote because it's so true to the process of creativity. The one thing, the one big stumbling block for us to be creative is the fear of failure. That's the number one thing that prevents us from actually doing something that's either vaguely creative or very creative. Ask yourselves how many times at work you may or a colleague of yours may have had this blindingly amazing idea but they never said it. How many times you may have sat around a table where people are brainstorming or discussing something and you kind of thought you had an idea but you didn't put up your hand because you kind of are nervous about what do people think, what do people say. The fear of failure, I go back to the school days, is highly ingrained in us and it kind of stops us from expressing ourselves or truly being what we want to be. Right? But that is the one thing, if you recognize it for what it is, can unleash your creative potential. Two examples of this that I'm going to share with you are from the advertising world. But they're really unique examples because the first one is my own story of massive failure. I told you, if you remember right, that I started my journey in India in advertising, then I moved to Singapore. This was a campaign that I did in the year 2002. A client called FedEx, you know FedEx, gave me the brief, my agency the brief, to say, come up with a print campaign that's going to get people to say how fast FedEx can actually deliver. We are the fastest mm -hmm. delivery company in the world, right? That's the print campaign I came up with, and I'll share all of the ads with you. So basically, if you look at that, there's a person who is who's unconscious in the street, and FedEx has delivered an ambulance to where they are. Now, the unique thing about this ad is, if you know the world of advertising and ads, there is no logo on this ad. There's no FedEx logo, but there is a FedEx logo just happens to be on the truck. Which in advertising is a pretty different thing to do. That's the second ad. If there's a fire, it delivers a fire truck. If there's a riot, it delivers a police car. Right? And when this campaign happened, this campaign overnight was an instant stuff, success all over the world. It was massively famous. How famous? We have this thing called DNAD Awards, British Design and Art Direction Awards. Has anybody, has anybody heard of those? Have you heard of CAN? Yes. Yeah, okay. CAN is kind of overtaken DNAD. Makes sense. Uh, DNAD awarded, gave this 14 nominations in the book, which is unheard of in the history of DNAD. It pretty much won or got nominated for every single award show in the world. And then we got a call from and the client said, we need to pull this campaign out. We have to stop this campaign from running today. So he said, I mean, seriously? Do you know what's going on? I said, yeah, I, I know what's going on, but you need to stop it. And the reason they had was that was the year when which the first invasion of Iraq happened. And America was using FedEx planes supply arms and they didn't want a backlash with this campaign. So to put it in perspective, the award shows I talked to you about is the Oscars of advertising. That's the equivalent of a film winning eight Oscars. And you're being told on the eve of the Oscars, sorry, you can't go out. The people who worked on this campaign were devastated, including me. Some of my colleagues took to alcohol, some people quit, some people never came back to this is just the truth. It was a massive lesson for me because while I was trying to deal with a failure, the one thing I kind of knew is if I could do that once, it's probably something in me that could make me do it again. I'm not going to walk away from the problem because it's failure. So that is just one example of it. The second principle that I try to live by is this. We all have problems in our lives of different kinds. I mean, it's just not always about work. It's to do with your family, to do with your personal life. But for me, I feel problems are nothing but just cleverly disguised opportunities. You just need to be able to see. Somebody told me this, and I don't know if it's true. He said, if you look up the Japanese dictionary, any, anybody speak Japanese here? 
nothing good. <laughs> if you look up the Japanese dictionary, they say you cannot find a word that's equivalent to a problem. The closest you can find is the word opportunity. So the Japanese don't have a word for a problem. And you can tell why the Japanese are such creative people. So when you look at a problem, you can either see the problem or you can see the opportunity behind the problem that's allowing you to be more creative to solve it. And I'm going to share with you two case studies which are my favorites. One of it is a problem that you probably have seen and encountered in some ways, but never really thought about it. If you've gone grocery shopping, maybe not in Dubai, but anywhere else in the world, the one thing we see when we pick vegetables are you see those funny little vegetables that are kind of deformed, or they've been hurt in the travel. You buy that. You pick that up. You don't. Nobody does. You do. Randa is, is different, yeah? <laughs> the fact is, every day, truck loads of those vegetables are dumped. That's just a fact around the world. Now, if you think about a food crisis in the world, and you think about that happening, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. Somebody looked at this problem and they said, wait a minute, that's an opportunity. I'm going to play you this case. Oh, what you Yeah. Okay. People are encouraged to eat at least five a day. A lot of money for families. On the other, we throw 520 million tons of it away each year. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to pull that back a bit. Ah, can you guys hear that? just underlines the idea that you see problems every day, whether it's personal or otherwise. But if you look at the opportunity, suddenly the problem looks very different to you. The next one that I'm going to share with you is very close to my heart. It's something I worked on. I'll just give you a background. Uh, we were thinking and brainstorming about India because I'm from that country. And this is about two years ago when even to today, the rate of, you know, women being molested and so on in India is at an all-time high, which is kind of weird, but that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. So we were thinking about how do we creatively empower women to deal with this, right? 
and we were brainstorming about it, but in the process, we came up with another problem, which was subtler, but much bigger. And that was that women in India, and probably in other parts of the world, suffer massively from an iodine deficiency. Now, in this country, we probably don't even think about it. But in a third world country, it's massive because that leads to a lot of pregnancy issues, cancer issues, and so on and so forth for women. It's massive. And the reason for that, when you do a research, is because the soil in India does not contain enough iodine for it to get into the food. So we were thinking about how do we come up with a solution for women that empowers them in a world where you know they're, they're in danger of being molested and so on. And then we uncovered this problem and we said, wait, what if we could find a way, so I'm just taking you through the thought process, which is kind of where we were. What if we can address this problem as an opportunity? Because what we were saying is, if a woman had something, some way in which she could get that iodine without having to actually pop a tablet, which they can do, but it's not really the best way to do it, wouldn't that be wonderful? And we said, what about wearable technology? Could we have something that she wears on her hand and so on and so forth? But this is rural India. And in rural India, there's none of that. They're still very basic, yeah? Then we said, wait a minute, let's flip it around and see where the opportunity is. And the opportunity is amazing because in India, almost all the women wear something called the bindi. You guys seen that? Mm -hmm. Right, that's the thing you wear on your head. And we said, wait a minute, can that be our wearable tech? Right? I'm going to play this one. Across rural India, suffer from life-threatening diseases. Most of these cases are linked to an iodine deficiency. Supplements exist, but women couldn't afford any. So how do you help them? Almost every Indian woman wears a bindi. Introducing the life-saving dot, Jeevan Bindi. An idea that transformed bindis into iodine patches. Women require a daily dosage of iodine. During the day, these bindis dispense that amount to the wearer. These life-saving dots were distributed to medical camps across rural India. In a nation of 500 million women, bindis were no longer just a symbol of beauty. They now spelled the difference between life and death. The life-saving dot. So, thank you. This rolled out in India and it was so easy that the government said this should become a health initiative everywhere we go because it's so easy to do. So again, it's a problem, but on the other side of the problem is actually an opportunity to do something good. So I don't want to leave you with just the theory of it. You've got a piece of paper in your hand. So this is a, a test that I personally love doing for myself and my team everywhere I go. You can do this for yourself every day or every second day or every third day. We spoke about problems, opportunities. We spoke about the fear of failure. We spoke a little bit about what really stops us, why children are so creative and we are not. A psychologist designed this test, not me. Right? It's called the 30 circles test. They are 30 circles on your paper. All I want you to do is take two minutes and convert each of the circles into as many objects as you can in two minutes. There's no judgment here, folks. I think James already gave you a few, right? We talked about a sun and a moon, right? Could be an apple, that's three. There's 27 more to go. So I'm gonna time you for just two minutes. You've got a pencil or a pen. Turn that into as many objects as you can. Starting now. It's absolutely gripping, but we'll have to stop. Yeah, and move on. But it's good, keep that paper with you. And my sincere advice to you is, it's an absolutely simple way to unlock your mind, to look at things differently. What that does is, it forces you to see the same object every single time. 
And there's no better way for you to start training your mind, at least from a very simple way and a creative way than the 30 seconds test. Try it at home. Then the next thing we're gonna do is, I asked a question about 10 minutes ago on what happens, what do you get when ice melts? That was a question posed to fourth, fifth graders in Japan, right? You have the answers written down somewhere, but this is the answer that stood out in the test. That's what the fourth grader wrote. What do you get when I smell she wrote spring? Right? You don't have to tell me what you wrote, but I just want you to think about it. Going back to the fact that when you're a child, the world is a very different place. When you grow up, it's the same world. It's just that your thinking and the way you see the world has changed dramatically. We need to go back. We need to find that creativity in us because everyone can definitely be creative. I'm going to end with just a little bit of philosophy, so bear with me. Right? Why is it important for us to be creative? I mean, the, all the reasons that are practical I've shared with you. But this is one thing that I've never really spoken to any, anybody about to today, to be honest, and it's something that I strongly believe in. So I'm going to give you another small test. This is a 30 second one. I want you to close your eyes for 30 seconds and think about the one thing in your life that is so unique as an event that it never happened before in the history of humanity and it's never going to happen again in the history of humanity. So I'll repeat that. 30 seconds to think about the one event in your life, the one thing in your life that never happened before and will never ever happen again. Starting now. Close your eyes and think about it. The one thing that never happened before and will never happen again. Okay. I don't want to know the answers, but you should have the answer yourself. If somebody's thinking, oh, the job I got, that's not very unique. A lot of people get great jobs. If it's the person I met and married, well, kind of unique, but a lot of people meet great people and they get married to it. The one thing that 100% is never, has never happened in your life before and will never happen again is on a certain date, on a certain time, sometime in the world, you appear into the world. Nothing ever happened before that is similar or the same, and nothing will ever happen again that is exactly the same. There is just one of you in the universe, and that's how it is. Why I say that is, then it really becomes important to ask ourselves, what does that mean for me? And for me, it's about the opportunity to do something that's creative, to make a difference in some way for the opportunity I've been given to be on this earth. And I just want you to think about that as you go away because you are unique and whatever you create is yours and it's unique. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about it. So I'm gonna end with saying, go ahead and create and thank you so much for listening to me.
Wonderful. Everyone, let's say creative mornings. Creative, creative mornings. mornings. Yeah.